Friedrich Nietzsche was a unique philosopher in that much of his work is directed towards dismantling previous philosophical beliefs, which he regarded as clumsy and inauthentic. His belief was that the purpose of philosophy wasn't necessarily for finding the truth, but rather to enrich our lives and discover new values. In this spirit, Nietzsche often discussed his observations regarding the subtleties of human psychology, revealing that our behavior has many sides to it, and our motivations are often concealed even from ourselves. He hoped that by understanding the complex nature of the human psyche, we would understand ourselves better and hence be freer to make our own decisions without being at the mercy of our psychological tendencies. Nietzsche's writings are filled with colorful, metaphorical language, making the exact meaning sometimes difficult to decipher, and so it is useful to note that his quotes may be subject to multiple interpretations. Nietzsche was also very fond of aphorisms, short, poignant statements which often reveal quite a lot. The greater part of conscious thinking of a philosopher is secretly guided and forced into definite channels by his instincts. Here, Nietzsche argues that what we call our rationality and logical thinking is in fact not as rational as we would like to believe, since many unconscious factors may bias us to think one way or another, but because such factors are unconscious, we rarely become aware of them. We often justify our decisions as being logical, reasonable, and even rational, even when they are not. This is why people may bring up all sorts of justifications or rationalizations after doing something wrong, such as cheating on a partner, when really the primary factor was the unconscious desire for pleasure. The fact that instinct underlies so many of our actions can feel disempowering since we may will to do something productive or creative, only to be forced elsewhere by our more primitive drives, as Nietzsche writes. The belly is the reason why man does not so readily take himself for a god. However, being conscious of this fact does give us some power over it. Another unconscious motivator is the desire for power. In fact, Nietzsche came to believe that the will to power was the cardinal drive in human behavior. Physiologists should think before putting down the instinct of life preservation as the cardinal instinct of an organic being. A living thing seeks above all to release its strength. Life itself is will to power. Self-preservation is only one of its indirect and most frequent results. We are all unconsciously motivated by a desire for power, for the ability to control and influence the world around us, and for the power to make our own decisions, rather than having the will of others imposed upon us. This desire for power can be seen at the highest levels of governments, where people in control go to extreme lengths to preserve their power and dominate the will of others. This isn't just true of governments, but of all people who desire influence and to control others. It is for this reason that people are constantly driven to reach the top of their career ladders, for example. Nietzsche, however, didn't believe that this will was something to be feared, especially since it is the will to power which drives us in our personal lives to be more assertive and to stand our ground when we feel we are being wronged. It is also the will to power which enables us to seize our destiny and overcome obstacles which may be in our paths. Nietzsche was also a keen observer of the human mind and noted its flaws, such as the fact that memories are unreliable. I did that, says my memory. I could not have done that, says my pride and remains unshakable. Eventually, memory yields. This speaks to the fact that we often have a tendency to edit our memories after the fact to make them more digestible. People who were bullies in their childhood may try to remember things differently to avoid having to confront an ugly past, and hence paint themselves in a more positive light. This is one of the flaws of the ego, since we often imagine ourselves in a different light to who we actually are, and hence our tendency to edit our memories so that they are easier to swallow. The ego can also be absorbed by pride, as Nietzsche writes, To shut your ears, even to the best counterarguments, once the decision has been made, a sign of a strong character, and occasionally a will to stupidity. On the one hand, it is a virtue to have strong beliefs, since these help define our character and preserve our individuality, but at the same time having a solid ego can make us close-minded and unwilling to change our opinions, even when we are clearly wrong. 
One of Nietzsche's more controversial ideas can be seen in this passage. The falseness of an opinion is not for us any objection to it. It is here perhaps that our new language sounds most strangely. The question is, how far an opinion is life-furthering, life-preserving, species-preserving, perhaps even species-rearing, and we are fundamentally inclined to maintain that the falsest opinions are the most indispensable to us, that without a recognition of logical fictions, without a comparison of reality with the purely invented world of the absolute and immutable, without a constant falsification of the world by the number of people, man could not live. In keeping with questioning the nature of truth itself, Nietzsche here argues that just because something is false or merely an opinion, doesn't mean that it isn't valuable. For example, if someone believes in God, this might be a false belief, but such a belief may have value to a person's personal life, and improve their life in some way, and hence the belief is still beneficial. In fact, since humans can't know everything, we need falsifications to live as human beings, and many of us believe things which aren't necessarily true, but are still helpful. Human rights, for instance, don't actually exist. We just made them up. But by believing in this fiction, human life is significantly improved, and so it is okay to believe certain fictions, especially if they are life-furthering. In this sense, truth might not be as valuable as has been assumed, and certain beliefs, regardless of their inherent truth, can be very beneficial for living a good life. This poses an interesting question. Should we seek the truth at all costs, or should we be content with certain falsifications so long as they are helpful? Nietzsche believed that the free spirit, the truly free spirit, should be allowed to define his or her own values and live according to them, and that different people may believe in different fictions, but still benefit thereby. Nietzsche also had a lot to say about the psychology of dreams and the unconscious mind. What we experience in dreams, if we experience it often, is in the end just as much a part of the total economy of our soul as is anything we really experience. Dreams aren't random, spontaneous imaginations, but actually reveal significant parts of our personality. In fact, humans always seem to be dreaming, even in waking life. This is especially clear whenever we interact with others. We do the same when awake as when dreaming. First we invent and make up the person we are interacting with, and then we immediately forget we have done so. One way to interpret this passage is to consider what happens when we have a conversation with someone we know. We project our ideas of that person onto them, and have a conversation, not with the person, but rather our projection of them, which we have created, based on what we know about the person. Everything the person says is interpreted through your projection of them. This is analogous to when you see someone in your dream, since, even though they appear to be a separate person, they are in actuality a part of your own mind. If you speak to someone you know in a dream, this is coming into contact with your conception of that person, the same conception you project onto them whenever you interact with that person in the real world. Since you can't know a person in their entirety, and since language does not always convey exactly what we mean, we are forced to act in this way whenever we converse with someone. This is because you can't actually see inside a person's mind and know what they are thinking. So the best we can do is to fabricate the other person, just as though we are dreaming. Nietzsche also approached psychology within the broader context of society, and harshly criticized the collective. Madness in individuals is something rare, but in groups, parties, nations, and epochs, it is the rule. Nietzsche here draws our attention to the fact that some of the things we do as a collective society are really quite strange and are only considered normal because everyone else does them. Why do we water our lawns, for instance, only to cut the grass after it grows? Why do we worship certain celebrities who have seemingly done nothing? The collective norm has a powerful influence over us, but Nietzsche encourages people to rise above the collective and become your own person, rather than blindly following everyone else. Being different from other people may cause us to appear strange or weird, but keep in mind that what is considered normal can really be quite strange. But how, according to Nietzsche, can we cultivate our personalities and become authentic to our true selves? 
Nietzsche encourages us to accept who we truly are, particularly the shadow, the side we hide from ourselves, since we often neglect our most positive traits. The great epochs of our life occur when we gain the courage to rechristen our evils as the best in us. For example, we might regard the part of ourselves which desires power to be evil, but when we learn to accept this fact, it might make you more confident in yourself and more willing to put your desires forward and ask for what you want rather than passively appeasing others. But perhaps the more curious ingredient to making a great character is simply to act as your ideal self. This is a very interesting and underexplored fact of human psychology, that if we begin to act as a different person, the person you want to be for example, then this will slowly become your reality. What? A great man? I always see only the play actor of his own ideal. We can in a sense reprogram ourselves by redesigning our self-image and then acting accordingly. One way to solve a lack of confidence is simply to pretend to be a person who does have a lot of confidence, and slowly this will begin to manifest into your personality. We are so easily conditioned by the will of others that in order to be who we want to be, we need to act in accordance with our ideal selves, and slowly who we want to be will begin to manifest. But Nietzsche cautions us and says that in order to make any real significant change, hard work is always necessary. Nietzsche insists that only those who are able to bind their hearts through discipline and self-imposed order can truly be free. In order to be free, we must be enslaved by our principles. Bound heart, free spirit. When one firmly binds his heart and keeps a prisoner, one can allow his spirit many liberties.